Hello, please feel free to share your name as you enter our webinar room. I'm Katie Trouth Taylor, CEO of Untold Content. And in this workshop, I'm going to walk you through five key strategies that you can implement today to improve your writing and create more impact at work. We all want our ideas to be heard and valued, but communicating our insights clearly and impactfully is not always that simple. So I actually want to start with a poll and you can answer in the chat box. When was the last time you took a writing class? Was it high school? Was it college? Um, if you're lucky, your company may have offered a brief training in a stuffy airport hotel conference room. But for most of us, the writing instruction we received in our formative years was completely divorced from the business experiences that we all face every single day. So. I'll wait till some answers come into the chat box. I'd be very curious to hear. Um, it looks like some people are saying college was their last time. Others are saying they were lucky enough to have some training during their uh, business career as well. Most people when answering this question do say it's been since college that they've had a writing class. So at the end of our time together, I'm going to give you a special limited time offer for our first of its kind online on-demand business writing course called Wordsmith, a grammar and style refresher for busy professionals. I am so proud of this course. We've spent a few months here at the untold offices working on this. Um, it was highly requested by professionals like you, and we designed it as a course that would offer robust strategies, tips, case studies, and tons of downloadable worksheets and cheat sheets that can help you immediately improve your writing and create greater impact in your professional life. You do have to be watching live at the end of this webinar to get the special offer, so please stick around. I promise it will be worth your time. Um, speaking of time, before we get started, I know there are a lot of distractions all around us, but the strategy I'm about to share can change, <clears throat> can change your professional life. So I want you to focus in and use this time to commit to your professional growth. Okay, so you're probably wondering why I'm qualified to teach on this topic. So let me very briefly share my story. I'm actually a professor turned entrepreneur. And as an English professor, I studied book after book on effective writing. I taught rhetoric and composition, grant writing, technical writing, and business writing at some of the nation's top research universities. But when I, <clears throat> when I founded my company, Untold Content, I realized that professionals like you, people who hold subject matter expertise or strong knowledge in particular areas, didn't necessarily have all the tools they needed to write effectively and impactfully at work. So much of the reading and the research that I conducted as a professor wasn't getting transplanted into the hands of professionals like you, the very people who have the greatest potential to strengthen your writing and create huge impacts in your industries. And that's the mission that we're driving toward every day at Untold Content, to support thought leaders in sharing their ideas for impact. As a result, we've published hundreds of thought pieces feature articles and publications in collaboration with subject matter experts from Washington, D.C. to Palo Alto, California. Together, we've achieved over a million in consulting sales for writing for the world's most innovative organizations. And this webinar is, quite honestly, the, the world's first glimpse into our strategy for empowering professionals to become thought leaders through high-impact writing. So now that you know about me and my story, I want you to take a moment for yourself and I want you to imagine your ideal professional self. If you'd like to put some comments in the chat box, I would love to kind of know more about what your ideal professional self looks like. You know, I want you to think of the times throughout your workday when you need to write in order to share good ideas and make things happen. And in those moments, I want you to envision, can you see yourself sharing those ideas with more ease? Can you see yourself writing more quickly, spending less time agonizing over the wording in your emails? Can you see yourself motivating and moving your colleagues, customers, and stakeholders to believe in your insights and to activate on your ideas? 
Uh, what does that professional self look like? Is it a confident professional leader who's heard, respected, and understood? Our goal today is for all of us to get one major step closer to becoming our ideal professional selves. So here comes the strategy. Please feel, th uh, feel empowered throughout this entire webinar to take your own notes, but also know that I'll send you an email about 24 hours after this webinar is over. Started. From all my experience studying, reading, researching, teaching, and consulting on how to achieve effective writing in the business world, I've identified five keys to success. I want you to think of these as five levels because they build upon each other and they get more complex as you go. The five levels of effective business writing are level one, to write correctly, two, to write clearly, three, to write concisely, and with an awareness of context and culture. If you're missing out on any of these five levels of writing, you're holding yourself back from becoming your ideal professional self. That's because research shows that if you aren't a strong, effective writer, you're less likely to get promoted and become a leader in your industry. If you're a business owner or an entrepreneur, you're holding yourself back from sales and success. So before I share deeper tips for achieving each level, let's talk about what's Oops, sorry, my microphone just disconnected. Let me try that again. Thanks for your patience. Okay, hopefully that's better. Um, okay, so let's, let's look briefly at what's at stake when it comes to effective writing in the workplace. According to employers, writing is a top three most desirable quality of employees and job candidates. A recent study found that more than half of 120 American corporations took writing skills into account when making promotion decisions. And a totally different study found that employees who were not promoted into leadership positions within the first 10 years of their careers made two and a half times as many grammar mistakes as those who were promoted. Let's zoom out too and think about the importance of writing from your company's perspective. If the stakes are high for us as individuals, the stakes are higher at the organizational level. Grammar mistakes and lack of clarity cost organizations thousands and even millions of dollars each year. A recent study found that small businesses lose an average of $420,000 a year due to poor internal communication. And for big companies, that number is huge, $62 million lost every year because of poor internal communication. You know, looking externally, too, from a sales perspective, studies have calculated that businesses lose millions of dollars every year due to typos and grammar mistakes. We found one case study of an online business that was able to improve their sales by two and a half times just by fixing a typo on their homepage. You know, we live in a world where people make decisions and impressions very quickly. Research and wisdom has shown us that we get about seven seconds to make a good first impression when we're meeting someone face to face. And the same goes for the writing that we produce. People are more likely to call into question your authority, your competence, and the quality of your ideas when they see mistakes or they feel confused by your writing. You know, one of my favorite writers on this topic um, is Jason Freed. He's actually the founder of Basecamp, which is a project management platform. And he's also an Inc.com columnist. And he wrote this New York Times bestselling book called Rework. And in the book, he says, if you're trying to decide among a few people to fill a position, hire the best writer. Their writing skills will pay off. And that's because a good writer is about more than writing. Clear writing is a sign of clear thinking. Great writers know how to communicate. They make things easy to understand. They can put themselves in someone else's shoes. They know what to omit. And those are qualities you want in any candidate. Writing is making a comeback all over our society. Writing is today's currency for good ideas. What I love about this quote is that if you notice, Jason quietly mentions all five levels of effective business writing. He mentions writing skills, um, skills which can be understood as correctness, 
He draws attention to the importance of clear writing, which he and most of us, to be honest, associate with clear thinking. He says good writers know what to omit, which means they know how to write concisely. And finally, he reflects on how great writers can put themselves into other people's shoes. They know how to build the right amount of context to connect with their readers and meet them where they're at culturally. So today I'm going to bring these five levels of effective business writing to life by walking through five tips for each and every level. I want you to think of this as a five for five deal. You're going to walk away with 25 ways to become a stronger writer at work. So we better get started. Okay, level one. I want you to imagine throughout these levels that by achieving these levels, you're becoming a workplace wordsmith. All right, so to become a workplace wordsmith, you have to write correctly. Here are my five top tips for writing correctly. Think of grammar as architecture. Use commas with confidence. Use semicolons and apostrophes correctly. Keep it interesting by varying your sentence structures and build clear transitions. Okay, grammar as ar architecture. This is a metaphor. It's a way of visualizing your writing. The parts of speech, in essence, are your bricks. Verbs, nouns, adjectives, adverbs, pronouns. These are the building blocks of language. So I'm thinking of them, I want you to think of them as bricks. Your punctuation is the mortar that holds those bricks together. And as you create these two elements together, you create word architecture. You can build many different types of sentences and documents and work, write in different types of media. So using this as a powerful metaphor is going to help frame your mind in the right way to empower your writing. Okay, tip two, use commas with confidence. To be honest, this is the thing that I see trip that trips people up the most, whether that's students or professionals in the daily business world, people spend a lot of time agonizing on where to put a comma. So here are six times to use a comma. Number one is to separate items in a list. So here's an example. Katie went to the printer, comma, got the report, comma, and distributed it to her team, period. So we're really familiar with that first use of commas. The second use of commas is to connect complete sentences. So if you have two sentences that can stand on their own, the most brilliant way to create a more complex sentence and pack more punch into, into one sentence is to combine them. And you do that by using a comma plus a conjunction. Okay, number three is to insert connective words. And I'm gonna talk more about that soon, but those are transitional words. Words like, however, comma, as a result, comma. Number four is to use commas with interjections and descriptive phrases. So an example would be, good morning, comma, Abby, or congratulations, comma, team, you did a great job. All right, number five is to use commas for non-crucial phrases. If the phrase can be taken out of the sentence and the sentence can still stand on its own, that's that crucial phrase, that non-crucial phrase needs to be surrounded by commas. And finally, the last time to be sure you're using commas is when you're using multiple adjectives to describe a noun. So you could say it was a long, comma, exhausting conference session. You could always put a conjunction there. You could say it was a long and exhausting conference session. But if you wanna make your sentence more concise, you can take out the conjunction, replace it with a comma. Okay, correctness tip number three out of five is to use semicolons and apostrophes correctly. Semicolons are a rather fancy form of punctuation, but there are essentially two ways to use them well. Number one is to connect two sentences that could stand on their own, and number two, is to use semicolons when you're writing long and really complex lists. So if your list is so long that it's inappropriate to use a comma, it's better to use a semicolon to help your reader visually separate each item in the list. Okay, apostrophes are fairly simple. There are only two times to really use them, but this trips people up a lot as well. Use apostrophes with contractions and possession. An example um, is you really need to be able to tell these two uses apart because words like it's without an apostrophe and it's with an apostrophe mean two different things. 
with an apostrophe, it really means it is. It's a contraction or the um, kind of squishing together of two words. It's without an apostrophe shows possession. So making sure that you have tools in your toolkit to recognize that and work quickly and correctly with apostrophes is really important. Okay, correctness tip number four is to keep things interesting by varying your sentence structures. If you've ever read an I can read book with a young child, then you know how boring it can get to get to like page three of an I can read book because every sentence is exactly the same. It's subject, predicate, subject, predicate over and over and over. Now, conversely, if you've ever been to a conference or a workshop and you've sat in to listen to a really smart presenter share their insights or their research, if you've ever heard them speak in long, complex, convoluted sentence structures over and over and over again, you can get really overwhelmed. And that's one way to lose your readers and prevent or your audience or your readers and prevent them from being able to get the full impact of your ideas. So the pro tip here is to write in a variety of sentence structures, use long sentences, but also be sure to balance them out with pithy, punchy, short sentences that get right to the heart of the matter. Okay, my last tip for writing correctly is to build clear transitions. I love this part of the Wordsmith course because this gives you a little hint inside some of the downloadable worksheets and cheat sheets that we've created in the course. And this is essentially something you can print out and keep next to you as you write so that when you're thinking about how to transition from one idea to the next in your writing, you can rely on different types of connective words and phrases depending on the intention of that connection. So if you're trying to show result between two ideas or if you're trying to contrast ideas, if you're trying to show a relationship with time and how something changed over time, these are all different strategies you can use um, and kind of have next to you as you're writing. Okay, so now that you know how to write correctly, it's time to write clearly. Once again, these levels build upon each other. I have five tips for writing clearly. Number one is to choose the more commonly used plain English word. Number two is to tell your readers who did what. Number three and four are really drawn from brain science and the latest in neuroscience. And those are to front load your writing and to make your writing parallel. And my last tip is actually to bend or break the grammar rules if it helps your reader understand you. Okay, so tip number one is to use the more commonly used English word. You know, we can oftentimes feel like we should sound more sophisticated in our writing, but what that actually oftentimes does is it disconnects us from our audience and our readers. It convolutes what we're trying to say and it makes it murky. So instead of using a sophisticated sounding word just for the sake of sounding sophisticated, 90% of the time it's better to use the more plain English word so that you can drive to your point faster. Here's an example. Instead of saying, let's enumerate on the possibilities, you could say, let's list the options. Instead of saying, um, instead of saying we facilitated it, you could say we made it easier. These are ways to connect with your audience, get to your bigger ideas faster, and help people take action. All right, clarity tip two, tell your reader who did what. This takes us back to grade school a little bit. Um, every sentence needs to have a subject and a predicate, also known as a noun and a verb. If you've ever been told in your life to stop writing in passive voice, then, you, then you'll greatly appreciate this clarity hack. Passive voice uses a sentence structure that essentially looks like this. What was done by whom? So it's wordier, um, it oftentimes buries the subject into the middle of the sentence. Instead of using that structure, we want to use active voice as much as possible and say, who did what? Clarity tip number three is the first one that has to do with brain science, which is to front load your writing. Research shows that we as humans remember things better when we hear them first and when we hear them last. The stuff in the middle, sometimes we have a harder time recalling after we've read a document or a book or watched a presentation. 
And this is referred to as the serial position effect. And it essentially shows your probability of remembering. So this is really critical. If you've ever seen a fantastic TED Talk, then you know that they tend to do this really well. And you can do the same thing in your writing, making sure that your most important and critical information is shared right at the beginning and again at the end. All right, tip number four is also drawn from neuroscience, and it's to make your writing parallel. You know, we as humans love symmetry. We like for things to be parallel, and that's because we have a left and a right hemisphere. And so when things are presented to us in a similar way, our brains are able to organize that information more easily. Here's an example of what that looks like in a business writing context. So this is a de design analysis report that we wrote for the US Department of Veterans Affairs. And as you can see, this was a really long report. It was about 125 pages. And I'm just showing on the screen here two different section uh, cover pages inside the report. You'll notice they take on the exact same structure, even though one chapter is about blood banks and the other chapter is about molecular testing. We have this blue call out text that says the function of the space and we have the same heading and we have the same font. We have the same kind of de image design, even though the images are different and the content is different. The brain, when it arrives at each of these sections in the report, is able to more quickly navigate where to find the information because it recognizes that pattern and it sees the parallelism, the symmetry. Okay, clarity tip number five is to break the rules if it helps your reader understand you. Now this one can feel really uncomfortable for people who think about grammar as rules in a book that shall never be broken. But the truth is that language is adapted all the time. We're always kind of changing and changing how we speak to one another. And the whole point of language is to help us connect, understand each other and cooperate. So if the rules are failing to allow you to do this, go a different route. The big caveat with this tip is that you have to know the rules and you have to demonstrate that you know them before you're able to break them or switch. Okay, excellent work. We've just finished the first two levels. We have three to go. A grammar wordsmith writes concisely. Let me know in the comment box if you've ever received the feedback that you need to reduce your wordiness and get to your point faster in your writing. I'll be very curious to hear. Most people um, when I'm teaching on this topic say, yes, that's absolutely true for me, that I want to know how to write more concisely or that I get that feedback from instructors or bosses um, or clients. So here are five tips for writing concisely. Number one is to use active voice and action verbs Number two is to reduce nominalizations, and I'll explain that word in just a second. Number three is to reduce adverbs. Number four is to reduce prepositional phrases. And number five is to cut excessive wording. Okay, use active voice and action verbs. This is true, it's interesting that we discovered this in researching the Wordsmith course, but the highest grossing film genres are action and adventure films. And this is because there's something about us as humans because we do so much more than just exist. We live our lives, we make decisions, we create change. So we are active beings and, um, and writing through active voice instead of passive voice, like we talked about in the last level, is a really critical way to cut down your wording and arrive at your point more quickly, therefore helping your readers get to the next action step. Okay, reduce nominalizations. Nominalizations may sound like a sophisticated sounding word, but it essentially just means the noun version of a verb. So the, the nominalized form of argue is argument. Not to know is knowledge. Investigate, investigation. And oftentimes by transferring um, in our writing, instead of using the nominalization, use the active verb counterpart, you're able to reduce a lot of wording. I'm going to bring that to life through a later example. Okay, concision tip number three is to reduce adverbs. Adverbs are words that describe uh, verbs. They oftentimes end in L-Y, and the most commonly used adverb is the word very. 
most of the time, instead of using the word very, you can choose a more powerful active verb instead. Here are some examples. Instead of saying something was very weak, you could say frail. And instead of saying, I'm very appreciative of what you did, you could say, I'm grateful. Those are ways to just choose a more robust verb and therefore cut down wording. Okay, here comes that example I promised. In order to get rid of nominalizations, you're often able to remove prepositional phrases. Let's look at some examples. Prepositions you, you might remember are of, between, before, behind, in. They show relationship and direction in a sentence. So by cutting them out and getting rid of the nominalization and replacing it with an active verb, we're able to make our writing much more concise. Okay, here's an example. A knowledge of correct APA formatting is the responsibility of all of the contributors of the article. Whew, there are four prepositions in that sentence. Let's try to get rid of all of them. All article contributors should know correct APA formatting. There you go. Easy enough. We replace the nominalization knowledge with the active verb know. Here's another example. There is no current estimate of the amount of white papers in the possession of the executive board of the nonprofit. Here's a better version. We don't know how many white papers the nonprofit executive board possesses. All right, so there you go. What I love about this level of wordsmith is we share so many more examples for each of these tips. And with each example, we show you the before and after word count. So this is where the math comes into our grammar instruction. All right, my last tip for being a more concise writer is to cut excessive wording. You know, the English language has a lot of wordy phrases that can be said a lot more quickly. For instance, instead of saying, despite the fact that, you could just say, although. Instead of, and this is one of my favorites, instead of saying, in order to, almost every time you can just say, to. So this is another nice downloadable cheat sheet that you can have next to you as you're writing to remind you of ways to cut out excessive wordy phrases. Okay, well done. We are halfway there. You're about to learn now the most advanced tips for effective business writing. We have two levels left, so hang in there. And remember that after we cover all these levels, you'll get an exclusive offer to enroll in Wordsmith. I'm going to take a quick drink of water. If you want to stretch, Take a drink of water, take a deep breath. This is a perfect time to do that. <clears throat> okay, let's dive right back in. Context. This next level is all about writing with context in mind. As professionals, we are navigating so many different contexts. We're going from meeting to meeting, working on our computers, to writing emails, to um, to texting on the phone. We're always navigating different environments. And so depending on the context, I have five tips for you. Number one, to write the way you talk. Number two, to itemize instead of explaining. Number three, to offer meta commentary, and I'll explain what that means in just a second. Number four, to use positive wording. And number five, to always try to frame content from your reader's perspective. Okay, tip number one, depending on the context, write the way you talk. No matter what business environment we're in and what kind of document or writing we're doing, we have to transition our tone and the ways in which we navigate those spaces to adapt to those environments. So emails, for instance, have become less and less formal over the years. We don't have to be as formal in our emails as we used to. Um, presentations are still somewhat semi-formal and reports are some of the most formal business documents. So annual reports, scientific reports, project reports, all of those require slightly more formality. My best tip for meeting different contexts is wherever possible across all of these different types of media, write the way you talk. 
And that's because it helps people understand you and get to your ideas faster than if you write in a way that's uncomfortable to you. So once you know all of the foundational rules that we talked about in the first three levels of Wordsmith, you're able to start writing in your own personal style and voice and getting that as close as you can to how you would actually explain something if you had the opportunity to sit down one to one with your reader. Okay, context tip number two, depending on the context, itemize instead of explaining. This goes back to the idea of the serial position effect that we talked about in an earlier level. So we need as we our brains need organization in order to remember and digest content and knowledge. So whenever possible, instead of writing a paragraph, do your best when you can to use bullet points or to list out items. This is especially a brilliant strategy if you're writing about something that's not controversial, that's just facts, and that you need to be easily skimmable. Emails, for instance, are a place where most of us appreciate itemizing instead of full on long drawn out explanations. Okay, this is one of my favorite tips um, explored in all of the Wordsmith course, but depending on the context, guide your readers to follow your thinking. And the term that we use for this is using meta commentary. So here's what I mean, that's a little bit of a fancy sounding word, but meta commentary is the art of elaborating on or interpreting something that you've said or setting up something that you're about to say. So think of meta commentary as a second text that sits alongside your main text, pointing your audience in the right direction and helping them navigate to your intended meaning. What I love about this part of Wordsmith is I walk you through all of the ways to pick up on clues from your readers or your audience and anticipate how they might respond to your points. By doing so, there are specific writing strategies that you can use to meet them where they're at and help them interpret what you're saying. So if you think your audience is going to be skeptical, there are specific strategies you can use to try to avoid having them completely reject your ideas. If you think your audience is going to be curious or you want to encourage them to be curious, there is specific phrasing that you can use to pull them into what you're saying and, and keep them in that curious, emotive state. So anyway, this is one of my favorite parts of Wordsmith because I'm able to walk through specific examples from TED Talks and other really powerful um, presentations and writing situations where you can use meta commentary to make sure that you connect as best as you can with your audience. So one example, too, to think about is in an email, it's very helpful if you reveal your purpose for writing early on. And then you identify actionable takeaways through those itemized lists and be sure to have a main driving point that you're working toward. Same thing goes with presentations. It's useful oftentimes for someone to say what they're going to say, then say it, then remind us what they just said. So again, this comes down to that serial position effect and the fact that neuroscience is showing more and more that our brains desire um, and can recall things that happen first and last with most ease. Okay, context tip number four is to write on the bright side. I'm not trying to sound like a Pollyanna with this tip, but most in most cases, things will go better for you if you write in a positive light rather than a negative light. And this is especially true in organizational or business contexts. Let's look at some examples. The problem with his performance is his inability to manage time. Okay, that's very negatively worded. It's about lack of ability. Instead, we could revise it to say he, his performance would improve if he managed time better. Here's another example. You failed to complete the form. You, you failed to fill out the form completely. You could revise that to say, please revisit the highlighted items on the form and add requested information so that we can complete your application. Okay, what I love about these examples is it shows when you use positive wording, most of the time you're able to activate people around an idea or motivate them to change a habit or behavior in some way. If you use negative wording, people often feel stalled, like they don't know what to do. 
So in these revised examples, it's much clearer what they need to do next. They don't just feel terribly for making a mistake or having some kind of flaw. They have an action plan for how they can improve. Okay, and my last context tip is to write from your reader's point of view. This sounds easy enough, but it's actually somewhat against our human instincts because we're all walking around thinking of the world and seeing the world from our own eyes and our own shoes and our own perspectives. But the interesting thing is that our leaders and our colleagues and our customers are doing the exact same thing. They're thinking of the world through their lens. Wherever possible, in order to re really reach and meet your readers where they're at, you want to write from their point of view. Um, in the course, I'm able to go into really fascinating case studies of where businesses have done this really well and where they've messed up. So I share a case study of how Netflix actually lost 800,000 subscribers overnight because of a communication that was very company-centric, not customer-centric. So especially in business writing contexts like marketing and sales materials, writing from your customer's point of view is critical. Okay, you have made it to the last level of wordsmith. Let's dive in and talk about how to consider culture in your writing and why that's important. My five tips for culture are number one, to write with the medium in mind. Number two, write with gender diversity in mind. Number three, write with ability in mind. Number four, write with intercultural global communication in mind. And number five, write with discourse communities in mind. Okay, write with the medium in mind. We've already talked about this a little bit, but we're navigating so many different kinds of media today. And Marshall McLuhan um, has a lot of really wonderful thought pieces on this topic. And his argument is that the medium is the message. And what he means by that is that everything we say or write, it's shaped by the mediums that we use to say those things and write those things. So the ways in which we communicate on text is very different from social media, different from email, different from documents and articles that we create. And a really strong writer is able to navigate those spaces differently while still keeping your authentic voice. Culture tip number two is to write with gender diversity in mind. You know, the business world, the workplace today is drastically different than it was 20 or 50 years ago. There's far, there are far more women in the workplace and there are far more people identifying as non-binary in the workplace. One of the most interesting statistics that I found on this topic is that in 2002, only 3% of Fortune 500 companies had a gender identity non-discrimination policy. But as you can see from our infographic here, today over 83% of Fortune 500 companies have a gender identity non-discrimination policy. This gender, gender as you can with your ideas. Okay, this one's similar. Culture tip number three is to write with ability in mind. You know, not that long ago, it wasn't uncommon for someone in a wheelchair to have difficulty navigating a business environment. There were no handrails, there were no elevators, so people weren't necessarily welcomed despite their different ability levels. Today, that's completely untrue. There are regulations to support creating workspaces that are inclusive of people, no matter their mental, physical, um, any kind of developmental disabilities. There are ways that you can write in order to, again, make sure that people of varying ability levels are included in your organization and they feel part of your community. There are also really useful um, government regulations. One of them is called plain language guidelines and the other one is called 508 compliance. Um, let me know in the chat box if you've ever um, used 508 compliance or if you know of what that means. But it's essentially a guideline, it's checklists that you can use as you write to make sure that people who are using screen readers who might have vision impairment are able to digest the information that you're sharing in public documents. Inside the Wordsmith course, we've created downloadable and printable 508 compliance checklists. So you can literally print it out, have it next to you, and that you're able to check off 
different items to make sure that you're meeting those fed federal regulations and you're reaching as many people as possible. So for instance, one of the check boxes is make sure your font size is big enough. Um, and also make sure that if you're writing online, you're using meta descriptions and alt text. Okay, culture tip number four is to write with intercultural communication in mind. 58% of small businesses have international customers and 72% plan to increase their international customer base. These statistics are actually from 2016, so I can't wait for more research to come out on this topic. But as we see, media is changing our ability to reach people from different countries, different cities, um, completely different hemispheres of the globe. And so being able to anticipate and understand cultural differences in different countries and different nationalities is critically important to effective business writing. In the course, I'm able to talk through things like high context cultures and low context cultures and look at different nationalities and different regions to show how to adapt your writing to meet them where they're at culturally. Okay, culture tip number five is to write with discourse communities in mind. Discourse communities, we, we all are part of multiple discourse communities. And essentially what that means is that we form groups as human beings. We sort of get into networks with other people. And as a result, we find ways to connect with them. We, we speak in unique ways with them. We share values, mission, and goals. And as a result, we oftentimes use different kinds of mediums and genres to connect with them. And although it can feel like grammar is rules inside of a book, it's actually more the case that language practices are embedded aspects of who we are. The stakes are high in the business world where language choices shape our ability to reach the widest range of potential populations. So our ability to reach people, in other words, is greatly strengthened by our ability to write with cultural expectations and best practices in mind. So, well done. You just gained 25 ways to immediately improve your writing at work. I hope you feel excited and empowered to strengthen your writing skills to create more impact and influence in your professional life. But what I'm about to say is of critical importance. In the short time that we've shared together, we've only had time to cover the what of effective business writing. In other words, we, you know now what the top tips are, but you haven't seen them come to life and you probably haven't been able to digest all of them completely, which is completely normal. Inside the course Wordsmith, a grammar and style refresher for busy professionals, I walk you through the how. This course, I'm so incredibly proud of it because we created it after surveying dozens of organizations to ask their leaders and employees what would most help them propel their thought leadership and to create greater pull for their ideas. The overwhelming response was to create an online, on-demand course that busy professionals could use to strengthen their writing skills and increase their professional confidence. So everyone who enrolls in Wordsmith gets lifetime access to all the strategic know-how for writing effectively and with greater impact. I guide you through each tip in the five levels of effective business writing. In other words, by enrolling in Wordsmith, you're not just getting the what that we covered briefly today. You're getting the know-how for taking your writing to the next level. And speaking of accessibility, as we just did in that last tip, Every single tip in Wordsmith is delivered in multiple formats to reach diverse learners. So you get 32 professionally designed video lessons, audio files if you're more of a podcast type person, transcripts if you like to read and take notes, and slide decks if you're a more visual thinker. Plus, we traveled the globe to create five case study videos. We filmed them in Washington, D.C. and went all the way to London, England to film case studies that bring each of these levels to life and in particular draw on our experiences working with some of the world's most innovative organizations to help them use writing to be more impactful in their mission. As a bonus, as I've already mentioned throughout our webinar, the course includes 25, over 25 pages of downloadable worksheets and sheet sheets that you can use to print out, pin, and put into action. 
So here comes that special offer that I mentioned at the beginning of our time together to thank you for joining me today and for investing in your professional potential. I'm excited to offer $400 off of Wordsmith. You can click the link that's in the chat box. I'm actually going to make sure that the offer goes out right now. Here you go. I'm publishing it now. Perfect. Okay. And I'm also going to give you a link to learn even more about the course. And I'm typing that in to the chat box now. There you go. So you can learn more at that link, but you can also click directly on the offer if you are ready to take action. Um, you can use the coupon code WEBINAR and use it in all caps at checkout in order to get that discount. What I love is that we've already received such powerful testimonials from professionals like you who have completed Wordsmith. A chief operating officer at a Silicon Valley healthcare company said, this is a first of its kind course that's highly relevant to current business environments. And it's packaged in a way that it's easy to navigate, the lessons build in complexity in a gradual, digestible manner. Um, Rob Hart, who's the head of R&D at a global chemical company said, your, your people are your brand and their writing drives your customer's decisions. Wordsmith will increase your employees and customers' confidence. We've got great feedback from young professionals who said, I loved the accessibility of the course. I could fit it into my schedule. And also Lance Salliers, who is a Forbes contributor and a TEDx public speaking coach said, Wordsmith features strong instructional content well delivered. So I'm so proud of, of the feedback we've already received and I'm excited to hear about how more students are benefited by Wordsmith and I hope that you enroll in the course. So in closing, I want you to ask yourself a few questions. Let's do some reflection before we start our work days. Are you aware of how writing impacts your professional identity? Are you ready to write more quickly, efficiently and concisely? Are you ready to reach more people with your words and ideas, ensuring that your writing translates across cultures and countries and identity groups? Are you ready to become that ideal professional self that we imagined at the start of our time together? I hope your answers to these questions are yes. And if so, I'll so look forward to seeing you as a student in Wordsmith. I'm delighted to welcome you to enroll and want to remind you that that $400 offer will expire soon at midnight on July 30th to be exact. So please let me know if you have any questions. You can feel free to email me at info at untoldcontent.com. Um, and you can also learn more about the course at the URL that I put into the chat box and also that's shown here on the screen. So thank you so much for joining me today. Again, please feel free to follow up with questions and you'll get this entire video to replay for you um, via email tomorrow. Thanks so much, guys. Have a great day.